Today's episode is sponsored by Alone in the Dark. The highly anticipated new reimagination by Pieces Interactive and THQ Nordic. Play as Edward Carnby or Emily Hartwood to explore your environments, fight monsters, solve puzzles, and uncover the true secret of Dorsetto Manor. Our favorite heroes are brought to life by Hollywood stars Jodie Comer of Killing Eve and David Harbour of Stranger Things, who lend not only their voices, but their appearance and their formidable acting skills to the brave protagonists. Experience a deep psychological story that goes beyond the realms of the imaginable, all dreamed up by Mikhail Hedberg, cult horror writer of Soma and Amnesia. The team at Pieces Interactive is supported by monster designer and legendary Guillermo del Toro collaborator Guy Davis, as well as doom jazz legend Jason Conan, who provides his eerie and haunting melodies for the right atmosphere. Alone in the Dark is available March 20th on PS5, Xbox Series XS, and PC. Pre-order your copy now and escape into the dark. Welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Novak, and I'm going to discuss some intriguing and terrifying stories from Reddit with you. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to go check out my four-week guest spot on the Nightlight podcast. In the latest episode, Prince and I discuss the very controversial film, Funny Games. That's the Nightlight Podcast, also part of the Bloody FM Network, so you can find that wherever you get your podcasts. March has turned out to be an accidental non-fiction month so far, save for the guided nightmare, I guess, unless, perhaps, when you listened, you happened to summon something horrifying into your room. In which case, please email me at scarytosleep at gmail.com. I promise we'll get back to fiction next week, though I do know that dark reddits are a huge favorite for many of you, according to my analytics anyway, and this week I have a grab bag of some weird shit. Get ready to put on your high strangeness caps and walk with me through haunted minds, premonitions, murder, and the downright inexplicable. Let's start with the haunted mine, because who doesn't love a haunted mine? Probably this guy, actually. This was posted in the subreddit, The Truth Is Here, and for my fellow high strangeness lovers, I recommend giving that subreddit a gander. It's got a lot of great, weird stories. Posted from a throwaway account, and for those of you who aren't aware and haven't listened to previous dark reddit episodes, A throwaway account is a profile one creates in order to post something they don't want traced back to their main account. Because even though Reddit is anonymous to a certain extent, sometimes when you search someone's real profile, you can kind of gauge who that person is if you read enough into all their comments and posts and things. So I usually find the the juicier stuff under throwaway accounts. I've found everything from confessions to murder, um, adulterous affairs, uh, so many just different things that people use their throwaway accounts for, including paranormal stories. Because, you know, if you work in an industry, maybe like this particular person, you don't want your coworkers finding out you posted this story and maybe laughing at you. I don't know. I don't know why people, I'm sure there's there's a myriad of reasons why people would post something paranormal under a throwaway account. So this is from Throw1374, and it was posted on December 20th, 2019. I saw something in a decommissioned mine. I work in 3D laser scanning. I laser scan things to capture the geometry of the site when bad things happen. Think car accidents or industrial accidents. When bad things happen, I show up to document the scene so that when lawyers argue over what was there is an actual 3D model of what was actually what. Several years ago, maybe 2012-ish, 
I went to a coal mine in West Virginia, no idea which, but that coal mine was decommissioned. I was done and the entrance was slated to be filled with 25 feet of concrete the next week. An accident happened way down there and they wanted the mining machine and the area documented since it would be inaccessible in the future. So I scanned the area and the machine and that was about that. This particular area was near the end of the run. It wasn't a straight down mine like you might imagine. It was a three mile ride on some personnel rail cars to the end. It was basically into the hill, not straight down. I know for a fact anyone in that mine was on our train of carts. On the way down, you see that there's hundreds of offshoots where the coal was mined, all lighted, all like 90 degrees from the rails. These were mined early. The train kept going for three miles or so to get to where we went. Spent a long time setting the scene. Woo. Anyway, the weird thing happens on the way up. It takes like 45 minutes to go in and out from where we were. On the way up, I am just randomly looking out. The seats face 90 degrees from the train travel. As we come up to the other side of the passage, and I see a fucking little girl standing at the end of one of the tunnels, like 30 feet away, just standing there. I saw a hundred of those tunnels, but I saw a little girl in one. It shocked me. After that, I just looked down and never looked into the void of those tunnels again. My coworker asked me if I saw something in the tunnels. I said yes, and we never talked about it further. First of all, that's horrifying. (laughs) Could you imagine being three miles into a mountain or a hill, I guess, and seeing a little girl standing there at the end of a tunnel? No thank you. And as so often happens on Reddit, the comments were full of more stories. Reddit user Inous, I-N-O-U-S, don't know how to pronounce that, said... I went to an old copper mine in Arizona to do a tour and asked one of the owners there if they've seen anything weird. He went on to tell me that one night he took one of the trains described in OP's story to close up for the day. It takes about 20 minutes to get down there and he said when he got down there by himself, he saw what looked like a headlamp walking up the tracks toward him. He booked it the fuck out of there and doesn't go into the mine at night. This place had something like 13 fatalities during its operating years. Mining is dangerous as hell. Fuck that. Then came user Ballistic Habit, who said, I am a real-life former underground coal miner in West Virginia. There are so many things down there that can fuck up your whole world just doing your job. Now, I have seen things, unexplainable things. I have heard stories from serious, honest, hard-working, sober men that know what they saw. And what they saw can range from just strange to downright terrifying. Edit, by popular demand, I will start a thread of some of these stories. Ballistic Habit didn't exactly start a long new thread. I looked and I tried to go through their user history and their post history. I couldn't find anything that he had done separately or they had done separately. But here are a few other comments I found from Ballistic Habit in that same um, post. Some men I know were working in a future long wall section. They witnessed someone or thing that looked like a man complete with reflective clothing and a dim cap light walk from a cross cut across an entry and disappear directly into the coal seam. Shocked, They hurried to the location while calling our dispatcher to check our tracking because they were supposed to be the only men there working at the time. Dispatch reported that theirs were the only current devices on the section. These men walked around looking for any sign or evidence of someone there. They gave up after a bit and returned to where they had set down their gear. They were very shocked to find their lunches and gear scattered everywhere. Lunch buckets dumped, jackets thrown around, and some tools weirdly arranged. These guys were 1,500 plus feet underground and literally miles from the portal. 
another comment from Ballistic Habit. Okay, I've been asked to elaborate some. The most common thing I've seen is lights. So a coal mine is the darkest place ever. If you are alone and shut off your cap light, you cannot see anything. And I mean your own hand one inch from your face. It's inky black nothingness. Well, many times I've been working and keep seeing a cap light moving around where I know no one else is working. I've even radio dispatch to ask them to check our tracking devices for other miners. But no one is there. But I see a cap light. Someone asked, how do tracking devices work in a mine? I'm curious. And Ballistic Habit said, radio signal. There are hundreds of small receivers strategically placed around the mine. Each miner has a small radio transponder that communicates with the receivers. They log our positions as we move about the mine. They exist because coal mines sometimes have a tendency to explode and or catch fire. During these times, it is imperative to rescue men before they are overcome with toxic gases. If they are killed or cannot be rescued, it helps in recovering their body. If it can be recovered. So then user Tirefire chimed in with this story and this gave me chills. I work in an open cut strip mine digging coal and the site we are working on has been around forever. They closed it many years ago as it was no longer financially viable to dig it, but a small company bought it and fired the site up again and I work for them. There are many old pits about 250 meters deep and we slowly backfill them in with dirt from the new pits. We had a crew of blokes doing rehab work, prepping natural surface for planting trees and grass. And one of them saw a coal mine worker in high-vis uniform and hard hat standing on the high wall on the edge of the open pit. They've pulled up their dozer and radioed to the other dozer operators to see if they know why there is a dude so close to an old high wall on foot with no machine or light vehicle. So by this stage, everyone on site is listening to this two-way conversation about who the heck this guy is. The rehab crew, six fellas and dozers, all have watched this person walk to the edge, fall on their knees, and put their face in their hands, then stand up and jump off into the 250 meter deep pit. The entire site was closed for 48 hours while they were looking for a body. Divers were called in because the old pit had 40 meters of water in the bottom, but because of the minerals in the rock, it's really acidic and a beautiful aqua color. So the divers had special suits and no body was recovered. There is literally nowhere for a body to disappear to. Everyone on site was accounted for that same day as we all swipe in with a card at the start of our shift. It was super bizarre. The poor rehab boys have copped a lot of shit over it because it's presumed they somehow imagined it. All six, at the same time. The exact same thing. A few of them are old timers who are the no bullshit types. If they are saying they saw something, I'm inclined to believe it. This all occurred on day shift, so it wasn't in the dark. Isn't that so eerie? <laughs> six people saw a man walk to the edge of this pit and jump in. It, I, 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 I don't know. Anyway, user is a kiss the rain had an eerie warning for anyone thinking to investigate abandoned mines. All over Appalachia, there are stories of the wails of crying children and even babies and less often women coming from the openings of mines. Those who go within to investigate don't always return or return in a mental fog, never to be quite the same. But they aren't children. They are never children, and they don't really look like that. My source? I lived there for a while. I'm a paranormal investigator, and I've been down in the abandoned mines looking for the source of these stories. I promise you, they aren't children, but they are about the size of them, so maybe that's why they take that form. That and they are clearly preying on human compassion. 
I don't want to spend the whole episode on this post since we have some other fun stuff to get to. But there's always a link, by the way, on Dark Reddits to all of these these ep- these posts in the show notes or on my website. It'll be in either place. So if you'd like to check out the rest of the comments, I highly recommend it. If you, it's it's Friday night, you know, grab grab a beverage, grab a dessert, sit in front, you know, just sit in the dark and scroll through some of these comments. They are so eerie. I had never really thought about haunted. I mean, I've, I've thought about haunted minds, but not to a, a huge extent. And the stories in the this particular one about haunted minds and so many people having experiences with them highly recommend it again it's in the show notes and if you forgot the title of this one is i saw something in a decommissioned mine oh and by the way the next post is also from the truth is here subreddit and i realized all but one of the stories tonight is actually from that same subreddit it's a hidden gem Seriously, like, it doesn't get the love that r slash paranormal or r slash glitch in the matrix gets, but it's a really great time. It, again, it's it's the weekend. Go, go scroll. I highly recommend it. So this next post is from a deleted user, and the post itself was also deleted. I found it on the Wayback Machine, and it looks like it was posted on September 9th, 2013. So over 10 years ago. Wow. A whole decade. I was such a different person in 2013. What about you? It's, it does get to a strange place where the internet is now old enough that you can look back to certain parts of it. Like Reddit. How is Reddit this old? Like how can you, like looking back at Reddit 10 years ago and thinking, what was I doing 10 years ago? Anyway, I've been in a very pensive place in my life. (laughs) Apologies. Anyway, this one is going to cause some debate, I think. And I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on social media. I really encourage you to tell... And and again, when it comes to a lot of these paranormal things, you won't hurt my feelings if you just go, I just think it's bullshit. But I'd love to hear all your opinions on this next one because it is a doozy. Buckle in. It's titled, There's a man I run into sometimes, and then I lose time. Today, he came to my door. Look, right off the bat, I'll admit this sounds very No Sleep-esque title alone, but boy, this one is fun. So, here goes. This is not something I feel I can discuss with my family or personal friends, but I'm losing my shit here, so I feel the need to work through it with someone. As such, I'll try to give as many details as possible, but I don't want this getting back to me, and I feel a throwaway account would cost credibility. Here's what's going on. I lived in this apartment complex four years ago when I was 16 years old. We did not stay here long due to problems with the lease, but during that time, I spent quite a few hours walking around the grounds. Now, on the east side of the complex is a bike trail that is raised up on a slope, It makes a half circle around the complex and then carries on into the rest of the city. One night, I was out walking my dog, Shasta, along this trail. It was around 10 p.m. in May, so it was pretty dark at that point. I reached the bend in the trail where the path leaves the complex and there was a guy standing there. White guy, maybe 35 years old, couldn't see his eyes. He was not doing anything. Smoking, walking a dog, tying a shoe. He was doing nothing at all. He was wearing a puffy down coat, and he had his hands in his pockets, and he was just staring at me. I laughed a little and tried to make that awkward kind of conversation that you do when you bump into a stranger, but the guy said nothing, just kept staring. So, me and the dog sidled around him and walked on. But I eventually got nervous and cut through the trees to get back to my apartment, without going on the trail again. I knew the way home from there, even without the trail. But here's the thing. The second I stepped off the trail, I can't remember anything past that. It was like I blinked and suddenly, I was in the hall, inside my building, turning a key into the lock of my apartment. Fast forward three and a half years. I was 19, seven months pregnant, and moving into a new place with my fiance. 
As fate would have it, we moved back to the apartment complex I lived in when I was 16. It was cheap, it was comfortable, and near where my fiancé works. We ended up in a unit four buildings down, on the east side of the complex, directly across from the bike trail. A week into living there, I went to take the trash out. I would have had my fiancé do it, but I wanted to get off my feet, so I waddled outside to the dumpster. The dumpster, which is right next to the bike trail. I close the lid on the dumpster, and after the bang of the lid, I hear someone talking. Look up, and guess who is standing on the bike trail? You guessed it. White guy, mid-thirties, and still wearing the same down coat. He had a cell phone to his ear, but not the new flat kind. It was an older flip phone, circa 2005 or so. Anyway, he was talking into the phone, and he sounded pissed. He was cussing at someone on the other end, someone named Lauren. But you know how when people have a phone conversation, and they tend to duck their heads down and not look at other people? Yeah, he wasn't doing that. He was looking right at me. After a second of this, I started backing up, and he started walking towards me. After a second, he was off the grass hill and onto the parking lot, and he took the phone from his ear. He then started snapping it into pieces, tearing out the antenna, breaking the screen off, and angrily throwing them all onto the parking lot ground, still staring at me. I turned around and ran back into the building as fast as I could, and I don't remember what happened next. Next thing I knew, I was on a bed in the maternity ward, There was a fetal monitor strapped around me, and I had a saline IV in my arm. My fiancé was there. After a bit of confusion, we worked out this. I came in from taking out the trash, and I was calm. I didn't say anything about the guy with the cell phone. I watched an episode of Battlestar Galactica with my fiancé and started throwing up a bit, which was normal for my pregnant self. But I spiked a pretty nasty fever later, And there we were, at 5 a.m. in the hospital, making sure I was okay. All this time, apparently, I was perfectly alert. And on the way to the hospital, I apparently talked about our plans for the upcoming Christmas. I was discharged an hour later. They said I had the flu. They gave me Tamiflu and told me to sleep it off and stay indoors. When we pulled into the parking lot, I got out of the car and looked for the cell phone he dropped. It was there, but it looked like it had been run over, probably by us, and it was cracked into dozens of pieces. I collected what I could, and it looked like it was a Nokia 6085. This happened in December 2012. Today is Monday, September 9th, 2013. I have not seen the man in the down coat since then. Until this morning. My fiancé, yep, still not married, leaves for work at 6 a.m. Not working until 1 p.m. myself, I am usually still asleep at that point. Around 8 a.m., I got up and put a robe on because someone was knocking at our door. Shasta was growling at the door, which was a little unusual. She will typically bark at people but never growl. I told her to go to her kennel, and she sulked away, and I answered the door. I should have looked through the peephole first, but... I didn't, and I cannot express how much I regret that. The man in the coat was on the other side. I remember seeing him, and I remember wondering, why is he still wearing that coat in this weather? But after that, I remember nothing. I woke up an hour and a half ago, sitting at my kitchen table. The first thing I noticed was how unbearably hot it was in the apartment. I went to the thermostat and found that it had been set to 90 degrees and was blowing out hot air. I wasn't wearing my robe anymore. I was dressed for the day in my work uniform and I'm getting ready to leave soon. My baby, now seven months old, was in her crib. She was crying, evidently having not been fed or changed. There was pee all over her bed as her diaper had leaked. Shasta was laying by the crib, 
whimpering. I fed the baby, got her changed, and checked my dog for any injuries. She wasn't hurt. I'm not hurt either, but there is blood on the floor by my doorway. I wonder if Shasta bit the man? I don't know. He's gone, and from what I can tell, nothing has been stolen from the place. What do I do now? Edit. In case it's not obvious, I seem to have lost an hour and a half in this encounter. It was 8.07 a.m. when I got up, and by the time I had sense to check the clock again, it was about 9.45. As you can imagine, the comments lit up with opinions, the most common seeming to be basically, OP, I think you might be having seizures, and the top comment being, from user Slowmoro, how big is the building? Do you have friends there that might have seen this guy? I think it would be a good idea to either confirm or deny the possibility of his actual physical existence and go from there. To me though, and I don't mean to sound like a jerk or scare you, this sounds like some sort of absent seizure. Many more commented on her dog reacting to the person, saying that dogs are also known to react and can even be trained to warn a person before a seizure. And of course, there were some more interesting theories, like this from user Cocaine Waffles. At first I was going to say, maybe you have multiple personality disorder. Then, like has been suggested, it might be an encounter of sorts with the men in black, as documented by John Keel in the Mothman Prophecies book. The possible tumor seemed the most plausible until I realized that None of the above explain away the physical evidence you have of the broken Nokia cell phone the guy trashed in the parking lot. The MK Ultra like mind control theory of you being a sort of sleeper agent and him being your handler is also interesting. I know this is scary, but I want to ask you, do you ever feel like you were possibly sexually molested afterwards? It's fucked up, but maybe this guy is simply a sexual predator and has gotten his hands on some Colombian devil's breath, which is a powder that can sort of make you into a completely lucid, compliant zombie temporarily, and in big enough doses, leaves you with no recollections of what you've done, but you're extremely susceptible to suggestion while you're under its influence. First of all, I had never heard of devil's breath, Colombian devil's breath, and that is horrifying. <laughs> that's real, that's real creepy. That's, yeah, love that that's out there. Uh, I loved that comment though, because it does, it's, it presents a lot of, again, more interesting theories, but it touches on some of the theories that I saw throughout here. It was not the only one that I saw mention John Keel and the Mothman prophecies. A few, I think one or at least one or two, or at least two or three people mentioned the Mothman prophecies and the men in black. And, you know, uh, this was from user XOXO Yo Yo. An alternative theory is that this person represents slash exists in some different level of consciousness, sort of like the alien theories. He does not quite fit in. You meet him and you have a reaction. Things become fuzzy, maybe dreamlike. You are entering an altered state, matching his level, which actually may be your true level. It is not something he is directly causing, just you having a reaction to his presence. While you are in that state, nobody notices anything. After it wears off, you return to your normal conscious state, and you are unable to access the memories created in the altered state. What to do? Nothing. Look to your dreams. I suspect you might find some insight there. Look to your dreams. That's very inspirational. Some argued there had to be a man, or something, present because of the physical evidence, the blood, the phone, you know, uh, the dog uh, barking and growl, or barking and growling and all, all of those things. Someone even asked if the phone had a SIM card that the OP could look into. Uh, unfortunately, the original poster never answered a single question and deleted their entire account. So we'll never know if they tried going to a doctor or figured out who the man is. Maybe OP is somewhere else now. Somewhere we haven't figured out. 
how to reach. This next post is a little quicker, but so fascinating. This is once again from the The Truth Is Here sub, and it was posted by a now-deleted user on June 23rd, 2019. They wrote, Coworker opened the door. What was behind it will haunt me forever. So I am a longtime reader, first time poster, so forgive me if my story isn't really that detailed slash intriguing. A few years ago, when I was 16 to 17, I worked in a restaurant as a waitress. There were two locations, one in my town, which I'll call restaurant A, and one in a town about 30 minutes away, restaurant B. I should mention that restaurant B is located in a rougher area, and many of my coworkers weren't from the best of backgrounds. Nonetheless, they were sweet people and I trusted them. I was trusted as a manager on Thursdays at restaurant B, which usually meant I was the cashier slash server slash manager and the only other person would be a cook, which I'll call Dave. In the restaurant, there is a front glass door that customers use and a back wood door, no window in the door, we use to take out the trash and such. One day, we had no business, and I was in the kitchen with Dave and another cook that was about to leave. We're standing around talking, with Dave right in front of the back door. The other cook to the side of the door, and me about five feet away from Dave, in line with the door. He had a bag of trash in his hand, and he was going to take it out. He opened the door while still facing me and talking, and behind the door was a person. It was clearly a person in a gray t-shirt, jeans, and a black hat. I saw him for a split second, long enough to know someone was there, and then Dave saw my face and turned around, which blocked my view, and the guy was gone. The other cook saw my face turn white as a sheet when Dave had opened the door and joked that it looked like I had seen a ghost. Oh, the irony. While Dave started looking around outside to see what I could have seen, I started actually panicking. I have severe anxiety and panic disorder. And Dave was trying to calm me down, but he also seemed really freaked out. He asked me what I had saw. I told him I saw someone. I described the person and what he told me next will never leave me. Dave started crying and ran out the door with his phone in his hand. He was outside for nearly half an hour. And when he came back in, he was calmer, but still nervous. He told me that roughly 10 years ago, he and his friend were in a horrible car accident, which ended in his friend dying. He told me the person I described standing outside the door was wearing the exact outfit his friend had died in. And apparently, I wasn't the first person to see the ghost of his friend. Dave told me that whenever something were to happen to anyone in his family, his friend would show up to either him or his family. For example, one time he saw the ghost of his friend and literally a minute later, his phone rang and he found out his father had just suffered a massive heart attack. When he had went out the door, he was calling his family to make sure everyone was okay. Luckily, they were. But not even two days later, he found out that his wife had miscarried. And if that wasn't weird enough, the same night I saw the ghost, something else weird happened that I believe was paranormal, but I also understand could have been paranoia. I was up front at the register, still shaken up, and a huge crow was hovering outside the front door. It was so weird. It literally was just flying in place. It suddenly flew away, and then a really strange-looking man approached the door and opened it wide, but didn't enter. He had the creepiest smile on his face the entire time. Moments later, the crow was back, and it almost came in the restaurant, but another customer swatted it away. The man literally turned around and left, didn't order anything, and didn't say a word. I know it sounds unbelievable, but I'm just hoping someone reads this and understands that what I went through is real because everyone I know doesn't believe in the paranormal and thinks I was just imagining things. So, what do you think? I think it's totally possible. Some sort of premonition ghost who has himself uh, attached to Dave. Maybe this is 
what Dave's friend's unfinished business is, just to warn Dave about things? Um, maybe, I don't know. The comments on this one ranged from, Dave should contact a medium, to, that's no ghost, that's a shape-shifting demon, I'm not kidding, one of them was m very much a warning, saying it's probably a demon, to, wow, that's a really neat paranormal encounter. <laughs> it was pretty mild comment section. Uh, so yeah, let's move on. This is, this one's a little more of a doozy. Our next story is quite the strange tale from yet another deleted user, posted on March 6th, 2021. This is titled, When I Was in the Army, A True Story from Fort Hood, Texas. This event took place about 1992. I was just a young man and in the military. I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas at the time. Those of you that are familiar with Fort Hood will know what I am talking about when I say North Fort Hood. For those of you that are not, let me try to explain so you will better understand why we were there when this happened. Fort Hood is a very large military base. It is probably one of the largest military bases by land in the United States. The main base, where you would find all of the buildings and motor pools full of vehicles and so forth, is just called Fort Hood. It is on the south end of the overall land that compromises Fort Hood, and just outside its gates in the town of Colleen. Most of Fort Hood is wilderness. That wilderness is training area for soldiers to go and train in, and there is also a large impact area for the artillery units that have to train with their cannons. At the far northern end of the base, there is a small complex called North Fort Hood, it takes about 30 or 40 minutes to drive from the main base up to North Fort Hood. In the early 1990s, there was not much in the way of buildings or infrastructure at North Fort Hood. The unit I was assigned to had to calibrate a piece of equipment, and that meant that it had to be set up and left in place for about a week while the calibration took place. I'm not going to get into the details about this equipment, and it's not vital to the story anyway. What is important to note is that we had to set this equipment up at North Fort Hood during the process. During the day, we had some soldiers who were there working on the calibrations, but at night, obviously, we were not just going to leave this expensive equipment unguarded. So, every night, we would leave two soldiers with the equipment to keep an eye on things and make sure nothing happened to it. It was very easy duty by every measure. There was a tent to stay in and plenty of food. Soldiers who stayed the night to guard the equipment got the next day off. Basically, we would just sit in the tent, play cards or some other game, and keep an eye on things. It was basically camping. I volunteered to take a Thursday night as my turn at guard duty. This was because I had vacation, leave time, starting the following Monday. My rationale was simple. Take guard duty on Thursday night, get Friday off, and start my leave time early. It was myself and another young soldier who was a friend of mine. Both of us were just kids. I had just turned 21, and I believe he was just 19 or so. Keep in mind that this is 1992, so while cell phones did exist, they were by no means as prolific as they are now. It was actually pretty rare to see a person with a cell phone, and when you did, they were in these big leather carrying bags. They were huge, and we called them bag phones, and they were very expensive. Needless to say, neither of us had a cell phone. Why is that important? Because we were dropped off for guard duty around 5 p.m., and everyone else left. We had no vehicle and no way to communicate with anyone. We were entirely alone if anything happened, and, of course, we were not expecting anything to happen. It was, after all, very easy duty. Watch the equipment, play some cards, eat some chow, no problem. We were sitting in the tent when the first winds started to kick up, and I noticed some storm clouds moving in from the west. Now, whoever they had set that hex tent up apparently had no interest in doing it properly, because as the winds got worse, the tent was really leaning as though it might fold at any moment. Clearly, we were about to get hit with a pretty severe thunderstorm, 
and anyone who has ever lived in Central Texas can tell you that the storms there can blow up quick and be pretty violent. Fortunately for us, there was a deuce and a half truck there with a shelter on the back. For those that don't know, a deuce and a half is a large six-wheel drive truck, and if you want to get an idea of what they look like, you can Google M35A2 truck. This particular truck had a shelter on the back, and that is where we retreated in order to get out of the path of the approaching storm. Before anyone asks, I should note that we could not drive the truck away from the campsite because it was needed for the calibration and we would not abandon our post anyway. This falls under the first general order and anyone who has ever been in the army knows what I mean. So we secured ourselves in the shelter while the storm passes and it was a typical Texas frog strangler to be sure. Miraculously, the tent did not blow over and I was surprised by that. Still, we decided to stay in the back of the truck until dawn as we had already moved one of our cots inside. We finally laid down about 10 p.m. and it was very quiet. This is a very remote area and while we were in a clearing next to a runway, there were no buildings present and all around this airstrip was just woods. Today there are buildings there as I have recently looked at the location on Google Maps. At any rate, we had left the door on the shelter just slightly open for two reasons. One because the shelter had no power running to it, so there was no airflow going through it. Shutting the door would have left us susceptible to the effects of carbon monoxide. We needed fresh air. And two, we needed to be able to hear what was going on outside. We decided to take turns getting some rest, although we had been told we were allowed to sleep if we wanted to. We were still on base, and there was absolutely no reason to expect that anything at all was going to happen. My friend was on the cot by the door of the shelter, and I was on the floor at the other end. I felt like I had just dozed off when I was shaken violently awake. It was my friend, and I sat up and he was pulling the door to the shelter closed and trying to put a lock on it by using the light from his wristwatch. He was obviously very upset and scared. It was the kind of fear that cannot be faked, as if he was trying to prank me. This was primal fear. I kept asking him what was wrong and he finally managed to tell me that something had grabbed him by the foot and tried to pull him from the shelter. My first thought was that he had dozed off and had a nightmare. He was insistent that he had not and even stated that whatever had grabbed him had said to him, We'll be back for you. And let him go as he was shaking me awake. I wasn't sure if it was a prank or not, but my gut instinct was that he was petrified and his hands were shaking as he tried to lock the shelter door, so there must be some truth to it. I told him we couldn't leave the door closed because of the carbon monoxide. I was the higher ranking, so technically I was in charge. He refused to stay by the door if it was going to be open even a little bit, so I agreed to switch places with him. I opened the door just a couple of inches and laid down on the cot still believing he had just had a really bad nightmare. He was on the floor at the other end of the shelter. Within a few minutes, some pretty strange things began to happen. There were scratching sounds on the shelter, scratching on the sides, on the top, and the front where the cab of the truck was. A few times the door moved ever so slightly, but never opened. Needless to say, that by this time, I was convinced that something or someone was definitely outside, and both of us were pretty scared. I reached to the end of the cot I was on and pulled out the metal cross member that is used to give it tension. After that, I felt around the cot and found a wooden handle to a pickaxe. In the army, we call these pioneering tools, but most of you will know it as a pickaxe handle without the pickaxe part at the end. This I handed to my friend, and I instructed him that if anyone opened the door to the shelter, We were going to start beating them with our makeshift weapons and don't stop beating until whatever it was was down on the ground and not moving. The scratching on the exterior of the shelter continued intermittently throughout the night. We made no effort to call out to whomever or whatever it was. I think we were both just in fight mode. If anyone had pulled the door to the shelter fully open, I had full intentions of fighting for all I was worth. I am certain my friend felt the same way. 
Eventually, it began to get light outside, and as the sky began to get light, the scratching stopped. We stayed in the shelter for another 40 or 50 minutes until the sun was fully up. At that point, I said that I was going to push the door all the way open, jump off the back of the truck, and if he saw anyone, just start swinging. So I counted to three, flung the door open, and jumped off the truck. When you are 21, you can jump off a deuce and a half and it doesn't hurt. Now, I would be far more cautious, lol. At any rate, there was nothing. Not a soul. We looked all around the truck and the camp. Nothing. What I noticed immediately was that, while we were leaving boot tracks in the still wet ground, there were no other tracks around the truck at all. I began to look for loose items on the shelter that might account for the scratching sound. Nothing. We packed up our gear, and about 30 minutes later, the relief NCO arrived in a Humvee. He wasn't even fully out of the truck, and we were putting our stuff in it to leave. He laughingly remarked that we seemed really ready to go. We never told him a thing. In fact, we never said anything to anyone in our unit about what happened. We probably should have, but I think we were afraid we would be laughed at. At any rate, I got behind the wheel of the Humvee and my friend got in the back on the passenger side. I drove down the road a ways and came to a stop at the main highway that we would take back down to Fort Hood. At that moment, there came a clear, loud, and distinct clap of thunder. I leaned out the window and looked up, and then I looked back at my friend who was in the back of the truck and he said something I'll never forget. There ain't a fucking cloud in the sky, man. I believe I probably set a record for the fastest drive back to Fort Hood in a Humvee that morning. I'm not one to believe in this stuff. I think a lot of this paranormal stuff is just active imaginations or people making it up. But something happened to us that night, and I will never forget it. It scared the hell out of me, and I don't ever want to experience it again. That's my story and it is 100% true. So before we dive into the comments, for those of you who may not be aware, Fort Hood has been in the news frequently, and it was actually renamed in 2023 to Fort Cavazos. It was one of a few army locations that were renamed because they had previously been named after Confederate soldiers. Hood having been named after Confederate General John Bell Hood. So if you want to read more about Fort Hood's colorful history, you may find it under Fort Cavazos instead. But so we don't get confused since this was posted before the name change, I'm going to continue to refer to it as Fort Hood for the remainder of this discussion. In recent years, there have been several shootings, an attempted attack, disappearances, and unexplained deaths at Fort Hood. According to the Vanity Fair article from July 2021, titled, The only thing I knew how to do was kill people inside the rash of unexplained deaths at Fort Hood by Mei Zhang. In 2020 alone, at least 39 Fort Hood soldiers died or went missing. 13 killed themselves, 5 were murdered, 11 of the deaths remain unresolved, some legally, others for the victims' families. One story in particular that seemed to spread pretty wide that many might remember was the murder and subsequent cover-up of Vanessa Guillen. Now, I'll let you research that all on your own, but I needed to give you a basis for the mysterious and tragic atmosphere around Fort Hood before I jump into this first comment. This was from user ksaf0520. I mean, whether someone believes in the occult, anything supernatural, paranormal, unexplainable, etc., or not, something like this gives an entirely different angle on all the missing soldiers from Fort Hood in recent years. I live in Texas with a friend in Colleen. I've noticed the spike in missing persons slash bodies found around Fort Hood in recent years. And I agree. Reading a post like this does give a very eerie angle to the already horrifying reality of so many soldiers just straight up disappearing. Of course, it is the US military, so there's definitely some shady shit going on on a very non-paranormal level. 
but it is interesting combined with this post. I mean, again, look into the death of Vanessa Guillen. That was incredibly non-paranormal. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anything, any of those tragedies. I just think this portion, like some of the disappearances that have never been solved, combined with this story, again, it may not even be paranormal. The first guy did hear someone say something. He said, they, we will be back for you. It could be a person. Anyway, many commenters argued about the validity of the post, most eventually agreeing that it does in fact sound like this guy was a soldier around that time. And some, even though OP mentioned it, some had seemingly forgotten that this story took place in 1992. And they were questioning why there wasn't easier communication, i.e. a cell phone involved. And then there was this interesting thread of comments from locals. This is quite the thread. I'm going to read several um, comments upon comments in a row. These are from locals from around Colleen, around Fort Hood. And this gets very interesting. User Cap'n Crow says, Grew up in Cove my whole life, next to Colleen. At night, not every night, but enough that I remember, something would scratch on my window. Not like a branch or an animal, but like nails on a chalkboard. Parents told me it was just my imagination. But it happened until I turned 18 and left. One time, I got the balls to pull back the curtain and found nothing. Next morning, I checked my windows. Nothing. Not even scratches on the glass, which shocked me because it sounded hard, like it should have left some kind of mark. Even my friends experienced it staying the night. I recommend looking into some local lore if that's not too spooky for you. It made some of my experiences being raised in the area make sense, in the only way that it really can. I can't explain it, but I know I'm not the only one who knows something is going on here. And then Maniac Mustache Ride replied, Hello, fellow Covite. I can tell you that the whole area is just a weird, weird suck hole. There's something in the water, or the whole region is just cursed. There are so many weird things that happen. There's weird political things that don't make any sense. I, as an adult, moved far away and baffled by how not normal that area is. Reply from a deleted user. I moved to Cove two years ago. I've enjoyed my life here, but definitely has some, uh, vibes about it, if you know what I mean. Captain Crow then said back, the welcome to Night Vale vibes? Yeah. Then deleted replied back, yes, it's like it's hiding something or holding its breath. I don't know. I've not ever felt like this about a town before, and I've lived all over the country. Captain Crow said back, For a while, I contributed the weird shit to the military. I think he means I attributed it to. But apparently, it's a surprise to its members as well. I've been looking into the history a bit, but the general region hasn't done a great job at preserving its history. A few things I know as fact. Used to be cowboy country, and the region was home to a few tribes. Cove got its name from the copper in the water, which is why it tastes the way it does. The area didn't get a good population boom until the military bought up the section of farmland that's now known as Fort Hood. Deleted replied, That's more information that I've gotten. I've heard rumors like there's a cult in town and people go missing, especially off of Fort Hood itself. Honestly, this whole Colleen Cove Fort Hood area sounds like cursed land. Cap'n Crow replied, Fuck, I forgot about the cult. Yeah, I followed some local pages on Facebook and followed that for a while. The leader actually pulled similar shit in North Carolina, I want to say it was. I got pretty invested in that for a hot minute, but then the sensationalism died down and people stopped talking about it. LMAO, that is just how weird this place is. There's an entire cult kidnapping people and I just forgot all about it. I've definitely been wondering about a curse of some kind, especially the more stories I hear. A lot are pretty similar, which is the main reason I invest so much time in trying to hear people out, because I have a hunch that some much crazier things have happened, but because it sounds absolutely batshit, no one wants to speak up. One of my friends claims he was abducted by aliens, but when I asked, he started to tear up and it honestly kind of shook me in my boots. 
When my uncle was alive, something flew over the house really fast and we didn't see it very well. We were just like, huh, that was weird, probably military. Then the military went after it, right above our heads and too far behind to even dream of catching that thing. Years later, now that disclosure is being talked about, I've read politicians talking about UAP flying over military bases. I wonder about what we saw that day a lot. Deleted replied, Definitely some X-Files level shit going on. I tend to believe people when they tell me weird things happen to them. Who am I to say they didn't? My best friend is a truck driver. He says he sees a lot of weird shit in New Mexico whenever he's going that way. I listen to a lot of other stuff going on. I didn't really notice anything odd until recently. I was driving home through Cove at sunset with my windows down. My radio was playing ACDC's Thunderstruck. I was stopped at the final light before going home, and suddenly, I hear this weird sound coming in from my passenger side window. It was like a vibrating, deep, reverberated sound. Then it was gone. Then my light changed and I drove on my way. Still though, I remember that sound distinctly. And back in is Maniac Mustache Ride. Or it's Maniacal Mustache Ride. I apologize, Maniacal Mustache Ride. I got your name wrong. I grew up in a house that overlooked a lot of the city facing to Fort Hood. One night, sitting out with my mom, we see a flash of bright light that comes from post, followed quickly by a second flash that comes from, like, Martin Walker, maybe? Comes from about the ground and shoots out bright white like a flash from a camera. And we both just sit there and wait. We're both sure that we're about to die, that this is a nuke and we're just seeing it before it hits us. So we wait, and we wait. There's no sound, no clap of thunder, no crack of electricity. Just nothing. I remember posting about it on the boards of MySpace. Not a lot of people caught it, but a friend's husband had texted her from out of Fort Hood and said he had seen it. He was out doing training and thought at first it was just a flashbang or maybe a spotlight from a helicopter. But there was no boom, no sound of helicopter blades, Just a huge, disorienting flash that no one knew where it came from. And then a new player enters, Melting Teeth. I'm late to this party, but I grew up in Tonkawa Village in Copperas Cove. This place, sorry if I pronounced any of those wrong, by the way. That place was haunted without a doubt. My sister's friend was spending the night when she woke up screaming because a young boy shook her awake. I woke up screaming when a young boy yanked on my foot. My neighbors all talked about a young boy peeping out of our windows at strange times of day, and I once left my gaming room to walk the dogs, and when I returned, all my furniture was flipped upside down, and my game system was turned off and unplugged. Even weirder, the nearby woods had numerous animals turn up dead with giant, perfectly spherical holes in their ribs, and all their insides cleanly removed. Even weirder, My friend and I trespassed on private property one time, and we found buckets of blood and organs put into a star shape in a big, cleared-out field. I swear I'm not making this up. Actually, reading about all these other weird sightings in Copperas Cove, I might make some posts about my experiences. Ten years of growing up there, I remember a lot of what happened like it was yesterday. What a strange place. And then, Cap'n Crow. I made a post in a local group after reading through everyone's responses here. Uh, things didn't get less wild. Apparently there's a local group dedicated to the high strangeness of the region, but I didn't get the name from the woman who told me. Over the past 12 hours, I've gotten some very strange tales. That was only a taste of the comments about this place, so what the heck? is happening around Fort Hood. Seriously. Hell, if you live near the area and or were ever stationed there and have more stories, I'd love to hear them. Scary to sleep at gmail.com. I was very aware of the missing people in 2020, but I had no idea that there was this lore and mystery that stretched so far back and to the surrounding towns. I had no idea. What blows me away is the similarities to so many of these stories. I mean, even the one with the the young boy like yanking on someone's foot 
like that was in in the original story that I read it was yanking on the foot. It was a little different. It didn't sound like it was a young boy. It sounded like a maybe a monster or something. But uh, or uh, again, maybe not paranormal. Maybe this is all weird government stuff. I don't know what is going on in this area. It does make me question too that there's they someone said there's a lot of copper in the water, and that makes the water taste funny. Um, I'm not a scientist by any stretch. Does copper do anything to your brain? Is this maybe a mass hysteria thing because of the water? I don't know. But I came across this Fort Hood story thinking, oh, fun little ghost story. Got into the comments. And of course, also, interesting story. I, I didn't really put attach it to the missing people because again the story was set in 1992 I was very again I was very aware of all the missing people in 2020 but didn't think to connect them until I started reading these comments and these comments were like well it's been weird for a long time (laughs) so anyway again if you're from around that area if you were stationed there I would love to hear more if you if you're willing to share I can keep you anonymous by the way as well I'm happy to do so So I had one more post uh, for you tonight, one more story. It's a murder mystery, but we're an hour in. (laughs) We're already an hour in. And when I started digging through that last story, it's actually multiple very long posts and can actually be an episode itself. So I think I'm going to make it an episode all on its own. And I'm going to end the episode here. And that's the only hint you're getting is that it's a murder mystery for the next dark reddit uh it's something really again very fascinating i found that i didn't really like these last two i didn't realize i would go down such a rabbit hole with them i'm very i'm really happy that i've i found all these i think this was a good one this was a good dark reddit i felt very good about this one every story was so fascinating to me and i feel like this is going to cause a lot of discussion hopefully a lot of discussion again um if you'd like to follow the show on social media it is at scary to sleep on twitter instagram and there's a facebook group where you can discuss join the patreon for ad free episodes just said someone ask about ad free guided nightmares for as little as a dollar a month you can get ad free all the episodes uh, all the main episodes for three dollars and up you can also get the bonus episodes just released a bonus episode today um fun little tidbit or little quick creepy pasta called red moon and those the creepy pastas by the way that i put out on as bonus episodes do not have intros and outros so if you're not if you you're someone who just wants to jump into the story and then be done with it and not hear me talk at the end there you go it's perfect for you there's even i put them all in a collection as well so you can i think you can figure out a way to just listen to those in a row from the app instead of having to listen to the other stuff in between and again, if you have any true stories or if uh, if you want to send me anything from something you come across on Reddit, that would be totally cool, too. I've, I've never thought to ask about that. But uh, again, scary to sleep at gmail.com. There's also a contact submission form on my website, uh, scary to sleep dot com. If you'd like to stay, if you want, uh, don't want to email me directly for whatever reason. Again, if you want to stay anonymous, you know, that's completely fine. Also remember to check out my guest spot on the Nightlight podcast. It's a film recap podcast, by the way, so it's a lot more casual than this show. Well, I mean, the last few weeks have been pretty casual, haven't they? It's been casual Friday, every Friday around Scare You to Sleep for three weeks. Look at look at that. Again, back to fiction next week. I apologize. I try not to do too many non-fiction fictions in a row, and I don't... I, it just happened. It, it just happened again. I'm... I'm just a person, as far as you know, anyway. (laughs) I have a bonus episode coming out. I don't know if I'm allowed to announce who it is, but I will say I interviewed an author, and it was very exciting. I interviewed an author along with Jen Adams, who is from The Losers Club and The Lady Killers Podcasts, and she was great, and the author was incredible. So that is going to be coming out on Tuesday the 26th which is kind of a clue to who it is. If if you follow this person, it was an absolute blast. Like it was incredible. And it'll be my first author interview on the show. And it's something that's, it's kind of, kind of a bloody FM event. It's going to be played across my feed as well as losers club and lady killers. I, there might be another one in there. I'm not sure, but it's going to be like a bloody FM event. That's why Jen and I both did it together and we interviewed this awesome author who has an awesome book. You'll see who it is. Like, again, I just don't know if I'm allowed to say 
quite yet and it's late and I don't want to bother the person in charge who can tell me whether I can say or not. Speaking of nonfiction, I, I, I was speaking of it earlier, um, but if you have any submissions you'd like to have read on the show, please send your submissions to scary to sleep at gmail.com. Again, I was kind of behind in submissions. In fact, a few of you, if, if you sent a submission like quite a while ago, especially in the last six months, go ahead and resend those. I don't usually say to resend things. I know. But, um, you know, my life was a little upside down <laughs> from uh, late September until now, and I'm getting my life back on track. So I'm realizing that there's little pockets of time that I'm missing because, you know, that just happens in times of high stress. So please resend those. I may not have, you know, correctly filed them. So if you send something within like the last six, seven months, please resend them. If you'd like, you know, no, no pressure or anything. If you're like, no, I don't want my, I've decided I don't want it on your show. That is also totally fine. Um, so yeah, send them, uh, send them along. Or if you have any new stories that you'd like, uh, send those along as well. And I think that is all. Oh, I know some of you like to hear what I'm baking. I haven't made my coconut cake I've been talking about for three weeks. Still, um, things got in the way, but I'm thinking about making it this weekend. I'm thinking of maybe actually making a pina colada cake because that sounds very springy and it's spring now, right? Is it officially? I don't know if it's officially spring. I live in Southern California. I don't, we don't have seasons. So you just kind of have to gauge with the vibes. It feels like spring vibes right now, right? I don't know. So maybe a pina colada cake that feels it's more summery. Shut up. It's whatever. It's springy. It, the coconut on the outside looks like a lamb, a spring lamb. Leave me alone. Okay. Um, I'm going to go, by the way, I mentioned, uh, I was joking. I think last episode, the voicemail, I think was it, no, it wasn't voicemail. It was some episode. I made a joke about people who leave me a bunch of hate comments on, on Spotify. It was cause I get some of the same people who leave mad comments every single week. And I, I made a joke about how they must be in love with me. And so many of you said, uh, just sent in comments about how you're in love with me. And that was really funny for a sp- second. Cause I, I just, I don't do the Spotify comments every week. I take it. I'll like wait a couple weeks and then do like a big batch of them. I forgot. I said that. And I was like, I saw the first one and I'm like, Oh, that's kind of, that's, that's sweet. And then I saw a bunch of them and I was like, I did, am I putting out a vibe? Why is everyone in love with me? I mean, I'm, I'll take it. And then I remembered it was cause I said that. So but it was still very nice. <laughs> so thank you to those of you who told me on Spotify. You can go see your comments now because I posted them or I published them. Uh, who said that you were in love with me? You can go actually go see who all of you who all said that and then maybe um, fight for my hand. No, don't do that. But uh, I'm in a fighty mood this week. We just had a mixer, a bloody FM mixer where a bunch of us from the network hung out over zoom it was a blast you you should be jealous because it was so many cool people who were hanging out i mean you know who's on the network so it was pretty cool and i made a joke about how we need more rivalry because we all get along so well everyone at the network gets along so well we all are just buddies we really truly are and i made a joke about how we need more rivalries so that when if we ever have like a convention that we're all at we can have like fights in the parking lot and i can sell tickets And this is why you shouldn't invite me to your mixers because I think of ideas like that. Um, Everyone else was like, we're like, look at all the nice things we can do together. And I'm like, let's do parking lot fights. All right, I'm going to go. I love you. Thank you so much for sticking around. This was such a fun dark Reddit. This was a blast. I seriously, these stories were so much fun. When I was, it was like just a gold mine this time. It was great. Okay, I'm going to go. You better be drinking water, Uh, especially, again, I I told you, through winter you should have been anyway, but the weather is starting to heat up. I know not everywhere. Some of you are like, it's snowing here. I think it's snowing where my brother is right now. But, you know, just get in the habit of it now, okay? I know you've already been through a lot. Time changed in most places. Some places it didn't because you guys aren't dumb and adhering to weird old farming laws. But um, time changed for so many of you, and I know it's one more thing, but please just drink your water, okay? Uh, Wear sunscreen if it's getting, I mean, you should always wear sunscreen, but like if it's, if you're starting to go outside more because the weather's nice, wear sunscreen, all right? Go get some sleep.
Sweet dreams.